Thank you all for, for uh, being here at the uh, end of, a, I think, a remarkable day and a half. Um, the, the, the panels, in my estimation, have been uh, uniformly high quality, uh, provocative. The questions, uh, I thought, drove the conversations uh, as they should. Um, I hope for the students that are here, I hope you were thinking about what research projects, what research questions uh, can I pull out of the things that I heard? Who should I ask to push it further? Um, but uh, this is, the, I guess, the fourth annual uh, uh, Global Environmental uh, Justice Conference. Um, and we began, as you recall, with the Secretary General of CARICOM, which is appropriate, and we'll talk about that later. But it's my distinct uh, honor and pleasure to uh, introduce Ofemi Taiwo, who is a professor of philosophy at Georgetown University, where he focuses on Africana and social political philosophy. And he emphasizes themes and figures from anti-capitalist, anti-colonial, and black radical traditions. He is also the author of a book which you should all go out and buy if Atticus is still open, uh, uh, um, called uh, Reconsidering Reparations. Uh, for those of you who are going to take environmental justice next semester, don't worry, you'll read it. Uh, um, uh, and a provocative book called Elite Capture. Uh, and with that, I'd like to introduce Demi Taiwo. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Professor Torres. Uh, uh, thanks to Chris and all the folks who put this together. Um, I don't want to say too much uh, because I'm interested in hearing from Professor Torres, hearing from everybody else. Um, I do want to at least set the stage with basically less what I think about climate politics and more how. Um, and the how is what you see on the screen. It's all, it's all distribution, all the way down. Um, and I'm just going to say a little bit about what that perspective is and what it leads me to focus on when I think about climate politics. Um, so if you talk about climate politics or if you're you're on social media where climate politics is discussed, or if you read the big headlines from the major papers, you often hear people talk about the emissions and the difference in the production of emissions of different parts of the world. Um, so you see a map of the formal state system on the screen, and you see um, different shares of cumulative emissions. I believe this was up until 2020. And less often, in, in uh, different outlets, you might see people reference the history that is referenced by this map, which is another map of the state system, but one that is diagrammed to show different um, relationships to the history of global colonialism, in particular the colonialism that came out of Western and Northern Europe. And if you are in politics in general, quite more generally than climate politics, you might be, um, you might hear reference to these sorts of distinctions between countries. Um, just income level, GDP, GNP, how much trade, commerce, et cetera, happens in different parts of the world. And the question, or a question is, how do we relate these different maps? How do we relate these different ways of thinking about this planet? And of course, when we're dealing with climate politics, when we're dealing with environmental politics more generally than climate politics, we have to think about our actual ecology. The forests, soils, and waters that have been destroyed, the concentration of pollutants in the air, um, whether CO2 or any other kinds of pollutants. And so accordingly, Discussion about climate politics often involves talk about emissions, um, cumulative emissions, CO2, CO2 equivalent, so on and so forth. Um, and all that's fine. All that is true. All that's important. Um, but what's there to be said for this other perspective that you also hear from more of the environmental justice um, side of things that want to focus um, with the same level of centrality on political questions? Um, I think in general, 
it's important to think about the political questions. And in particular, there's a sort of subset of those political questions that I am particularly drawn to, which are these distributive questions, which I'll say a little bit about here in a second. So for the next five to 10 minutes, I just want you to indulge me in the other side of the oversimplification. There's one sort of oversimplification that focuses entirely on carbon and emissions. Um, let's see the other side for a second and see what shakes out in terms of what's critical, what's crucial, what's important from a political perspective on climate. So what if we took seriously for a second the possibility that the global distribution system, whatever that is, is the climate crisis? Well, you might say some stuff like this. So on this screen, you see um, another visual representation of the state system. Um, so there are data sets that split countries into um, colonizer, colonized, or both. Um, obviously, if you know your history, um, in particular the role of settler colonialism throughout the world, that distinction doesn't quite make sense as far as um, whether or not we really think the colonizers are only over here. But I think we can say that there's certainly a different relationship to the global state system that, say, England has than, say, Botswana has. So if you indulge with me that far, um, we could split countries into groups of countries that were colonized by other members of the state system as currently constituted, ones that were colonizers, ones that were neither. And if you mix that split of countries, which comes from you know, various data sets that um, Anna, Jeffrey, and I used, and if you match that with a climate change vulnerability index, you get the box plots you see on the screen. So there is um, systematic differences between so-called colonizer countries and so-called colonized countries. Um, the boxes represent um, most, you know, these are measures of central distribution. So systematically, um, the higher indices, the more climate vulnerability affords to colonized countries, formerly colonized countries, and colonizers much less vulnerable. What is also interesting about the particular methodology that we used um, to generate this index, we didn't come up with this index, um, but Adger, Brooks, and Kelly find that the index is, um, find that the indicators that show climate vulnerability are things like life expectancy, maternal mortality ratio, dietary adequacy, right? So not the size of your army, not even the size of your GDP, um, but these other sorts of measures. What are those? I think they're distributive measures. Why should we think of them that way? So um, if you are familiar with uh, Dr. Bob Bullard's work, um, you're, you will recognize some of these statistics. You know, he's a pioneering figure in environmental racism in one of the, in the study, I should say, in the study <laughs> of environmental <laughs> racism, not the, obviously that's what I meant. Okay, all right. Um, but one of the things they observe is the kind of magnet-like drawing of toxic waste, in the case on the left, um, or more broadly, green crimes, environmental crimes, of people who are socially and politically marginalized to the spaces that they live and inhabit. Um, the residential composition, demographic composition, within countries in the United States in these cases, has something to do, measurably something to do, with what toxic waste is there. Um, we could make that same kind of a comparison across countries. These are just more graphs from the same kind of uh, empirical descriptive analysis that my colleagues and I put together. And the suggestion is that this is actually the structure of our world. This is, in particular, the distributive structure of our world. It, there are different ways of explaining why this is the structure. If you like um, ecologically unequal exchange theory, then this is built into capitalist exchange. This is um, part of how it is that we exchange goods on a planetary scale. 
Um, we, could exchange, we could explain it through the political system, perhaps differences in environmental standards at the nation state level, explain why toxins and pollutions pool where they do and for whom that they do. Um, we could explain that across countries with the pollution haven hypothesis. We could explain it within countries with the green crime havens hypothesis. Um, but either way, you get stark differentials in climate vul vulnerability, depending on who you are and perhaps just as importantly, where you are. And again, the determinants of this have, certainly have something to do with wealth. The colonized countries are much poorer um, than the colonizer countries. You know, people love to tout the exceptions, your Chinas, your Botswanas, as far as the, how these countries map onto the history that we're talking about. But if you look at these distributions as a whole, it is clear that the countries that were colonizers as a group are doing much better off, um, measured in GDP. But the indicators of how climate vulnerability is distributed are things like maternal mortality, literacy, dietary adequacy, these are distributions of social advantages that are certainly derived from wealth. It's hard to build sanitation if you don't have any government revenue to build it with, if you don't have any money to build it with. Um, so wealth is certainly a constraint, but it's not just about wealth. It's how power, wealth, resources are shared within countries and across them. And so I just think this is just my perspective in general. Um, I wrote about it in the Reconsidering Reparations book, but we could think of our global political system as being a distributive system. Um, so capitalism is not just a production system. That's obviously an important fact about it, but it's also a distributive system. And it distributes things in ways that match hierarchies of inequality, unfairness, and injustice. Advantages tend to accumulate in the countries and in the communities that are um, most closely tied to yesterday's injustice, racially dominant communities. Um, disadvantages accumulate in the global south, racially disadvantaged communities, black and indigenous communities. Um, and we see this at multiple scales of analysis, whether we're looking within countries or whether we're comparing countries. So I won't say much more, um, but if you were of the mindset that this is the climate crisis, you might explain that perspective this way. Um, and here I'm taking from Amartya Sen, who did research on famines. Um, the old way, the way of explaining famines that was popular um, centuries ago, and is still popular in some corners, is to explain them via production constraints. Famines are what happen when you don't produce enough food, when the rain stops raining, when the bull weevil messes up your crop and your harvest. And those are certainly things that affect the world, but since we produce on a planetary scale, we actually produce enough. There's enough food, um, there's enough water, maybe not in a particular region, but in the planetary system, there is enough. So in the modern system, after capitalism, after the Industrial Revolution, um, it turns out that it's distributive aspects of the system that explain famines, according to Sen. One of his case studies is the Great Bengal Famine of 1943. Um, it, almost three million people died. The colonial um, overlords of South Asia at the time. The British Empire blamed the famine on rainfall. Um, Sen's work and subsequent work showed that that's not actually why the famine happened. It was colonial policies, and in particular that droughts after the successful anti-colonial struggle in India didn't lead to famine. So it is distributive decisions made by the British Empire, in particular how to manage the war effort of the Second World War. Um, but those distributive decisions explained the famine. So there you go. What to do about this? Um, perhaps climate change is the same way. 
Perhaps our natural systems are, of course, going to play a role, but ultimately what will be decisive are our political systems, in particular what distributive decisions they make. So who gets the money, who gets the vaccines, if, say, there were a pandemic, for instance, who uh, is insured, who is allowed to migrate. These sorts of questions are going to be decisive. In fact, these sorts of questions are the crisis. So, um, obviously, as I intimated earlier, I think this is, in some respects, something of an oversimplification. Of course, the ecological conditions, the sea level rise, the rainfall pattern changes are going to be causally important in and of themselves. But if you did have this perspective, where might you focus politically? I think you would focus on distributions, in particular, redistributing. So you need to redistribute things like cash, and there's a variety of means for which you could do that, um, or by which you could do that. Um, tax liability, debt, these are all things that many organizations, political organizations, civil society, activist groups have been talking about for decades and decades. These are just some um, citations that you could use to get into these, um, but these would be elements of focus. But it's not just cash that you would want to redistribute. You would want to redistribute political power. Um, so how decisions about distribution get made are themselves subject to power distributions, whether or not we have energy democracy or whether or not utilities companies decide how energy is produced and who gets it. That seems to be one of the crucial questions. How legislation is decided on, maybe by climate assemblies instead of elections, would be something that redistributes power in a way that's compatible with decarbonization or maybe even necessary for decarbonization. We could ask those same questions at the level of our transnational political organizations, the IMF or the World Bank or something new entirely. We could ask that within sectors, how knowledge is produced, um, whether it's produced at the local level by marginalized groups of people, by indigenous nations, by black communities to decide what the problems even are from a climate perspective and what solving them would look like. We have some models for that. Um, whether food production was controlled in similar ways or the power over food production was distributed in similar ways. But all these are redistributions in some way, shape, or form. So there's a lot wrong with an overfocus on carbon temperature. There is a lot we can learn from the kind of uh, polar opposite overfocus. We're going to have to settle somewhere in the middle. But I think there is something to be said for the distributive perspective, and that's the perspective I have and that we're about to talk about. So thanks again, everybody, and looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Now, what we thought we'd do is, is chat for a little while. I don't know if you want to have questions from the audience at the end. So, sure. we, so we'll chat for a little bit, and then we'll open up for, for uh, d discussion. You know, the, uh, when I was reading uh, Reconsidered Reparations, um, there, there's one sentence, right, uh, that uh, stuck out. Uh, um, and it reminded me of, uh, I said, Jason Moore, I guess, has a, a line that says, uh, uh, behind Manchester is Mississippi, mm. right? And, it, it, and it, you know, you, you can't have the, the mills or the mills and the labor uh, in, in Britain was standing on, on the shoulders on the people who produced the cotton in the American South. And the sentence you had was, Everywhere is New Orleans. What do you mean? So I meant a few things. Um, so the context for this is the introduction to the chapter where I argue for one way of understanding what reparations for transatlantic slavery and colonialism has to do with climate crisis. Um, I open with starting about Hurricane Katrina, 
and the lead up to it and the response to it from the various powers that be. And one thing I was struck by in reading what people have written about that political situation is how long the run up to it actually is. You know, Louisiana is part of the US because of the Haitian revolutions so that were going all the way back to the 18th century. Um, the geography of this part of the country has been literally built by decades of pipelines redirecting water. Um, the levels of the housing in the city itself change because the rate of subsidence is so fast that the ground sinks at a level appreciable on the scale of a human lifetime, which is not always how geology <laughs> works, right? <laughs> you know, it's a little bit of a distress signal from the earth. Yeah. Um, you know, so all of these things are going on before the hurricane. And of course, before the hurricane, actually the very same year the hurricane strikes, there's a conversation by elected officials whose job it is to prepare for these kind of incidents. And they're saying, wow, if a category three or higher hurricane were to hit, that would be some big trouble. Somebody should do something about that. And then nobody does anything about that. And then Hurricane Katrina lands and all these things, um, all these kind of sedimented aspects of the geology, of the political ecology, and of the actual um, structure of the levees and various kinds of protections that are supposed to be there for the city don't end up working and um, lots of people are out of, are displaced and lots of people lose their lives and lots of people have to deal with the traumatic fallout of all this thing. And, you know, obviously the particulars of that are very local and very regional um, but the general idea that what these crises are going to mean are based on the kind of accumulation of decisions or non-decisions of the institutions that are relevant, that is something that does generalize, right? Um, that is, again, on this kind of distributive analysis, that's the climate crisis. And so the question we should have, of course, is going to include what's the rain going to do? What's the, you know, what, it, what kinds of reactions are we going to see from the insects and from the crops? But even those questions are right. political in a sense. No, I mean, there's a, it, it reminded me of, you know, the, uh, there's a term that people talk about when there's a, a, a a natural disaster, which is to call it a natural disaster, as if it were just nature's uh, way of, uh, of, uh, of punishing us for, you know. But in fact, we create the situations for which, for that disaster to occur, right? Uh, we then categorize it as a natural disaster, but in fact, it's a natural disaster that was augmented by, by the whole layered decisions that, that you just uh, described. One of the things, uh, one of the reasons I, I, I focused on, on that sentence is, you know, people have described N New Orleans as, uh, as uh, uh, the capital of the Caribbean, hmm. right? right? Which I'm sure people in the Caribbean would not necessarily agree with that characterization, but it is characterized that way. And, and the reason I, 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 that came to me is we started the conference with the Secretary uh, General of CARICOM. And CARICOM gets some treatment in uh, uh, reconsidered reparations. And I wonder if you want to talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Especially in light of the, distribution, the, the distributional uh, problems that you highlighted, OK? Yeah. There's something central. There's something central about the Caribbean, I think. Um, and I feel like I can say that, you know, 
I, I, I hope you trust me when I, uh, when, when I say that that's just really my opinion, right? I'm Nigerian American and I grew, you know, my parents are from West Africa and I grew up in the US. So I'm not saying this out of some like, you know, have some chauvinism for the Caribbean. I just think it is a place where a lot of historically important things have happened and are happening. We'll start with Western colonization of the Americas. Yeah, we'll start, we'll with, start with Columbus, <laughs> right? Christopher Columbus lands in Haiti. Yikes. <laughs> that'll teach you. Yeah, that'll teach me to mention that guy. <laughs> <laughs> the ancestors are like, don't, don't talk about it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but, you know, a, a lot of this begins there. Um, and maybe even more centrally from my political perspective, I would think of myself as a Pan-Africanist. You know, it is the place in the world that I think has, I think, argued not that arguably, has taken Pan-Africanism the most seriously um, and done the most work to keep the possibility of that sort of politics alive. And so, you know, for political reasons, for historical reasons, the Caribbean seems central. But also, you know, we're dealing with a part of the world that has a lot of black folks, a lot of indigenous folks, a lot of people who have been affected by not just the emissions, but by the various hierarchies that built the world that caused the emissions. And, you know, in, you know, among those countries are small islands at risk of sea level rise and the kind of most worrying aspects of, yeah, I, I think that's fair to say, most worrying aspects of kind of short term climate impacts. So all the sorts of things that at least I pay attention to from my vantage point really coalesce in the Caribbean political context and maybe not surprisingly, the political responses from groups like CARICOM have the kind of comprehensive vision that I find attractive. Right? They want technology transfer, debt cancellation, cash transfers, you know, all these sorts of various forms of redistribution, and I really learned a lot from that in trying to develop the perspective that I have. Right. Well, it, what, it, what it does, when I think about it, when I read the book, it, is, it, is it reframes the whole question of reparations right, in, in, in important ways. Uh, because if you say reparations in, in the general American uh, conversation, people, people immediately go to... Uh, to a place that no one wants to go to, right? But if you start where you start, which is to try to understand uh, the, uh, the, the dynamics through which the situation we're currently living in were created, and what it would take to take it apart, then you have to start looking at the various institutional ways, like, as CARICOM has, to think about how redistribution uh, or reparations would work you know, over time and carefully. So, I mean, I think that, that uh, to me, it's, it's you know, the, uh, the global racial empire was the term you used to capture the, the kind of the racial capitalism and the, and the other uh, uh, framework, that framework. Uh, and it seems to me that, that that's necessary to understand in order to even understand what a natural disaster is in the context of a place like the Caribbean or New Orleans. Yeah, I think I agree with a lot of that. I think what I would want to say is when you think about the situation globally, I, I'm actually I actually think about it, I'm steering directly into what people <laughs> hate about reparations. <laughs> right. Um, I think what bothers people about reparations, um, and we were talking about this earlier with um, some students, what bothers people about reparations is the scale. Um, even, and especially in this country. So, you know, people, people have all sorts of rhetorical moves to get reparations off the rhetorical table, especially in the context of the US and reparations for the descendants of American slavery. Um, but I think the 
anxiety at the bottom of it is that's just too big, right? People understand the scale of what slavery meant for this country. And people think if we start talking about reparations, it's gonna go somewhere that I'm very afraid to go. And so, you know, my impulse was just, you know, let me twist the knife a little bit. Let's talk about <laughs> planetary scale, um, because that's actually what we're dealing with. Right. Um, and so I think if we can push past the fear and discomfort with the scale and talk about it honestly, we will realize you know, that the scale is not an impossible obstacle. And so we absolutely can, should, and must have reparations in this country for the slavery and colonialism that happened here. But also, that's part of a larger thing that we have to do and can do and must do on a planetary scale. Yeah, I, I also think that, that, that uh, putting it on the table right, is, is it causes you to think about the, 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 the economic structures, the political structures that have to be confronted to address climate, uh, uh, climate change, climate uh, uh, threats, right? So, I mean, uh, one of the, the things I also ask my students to read is, is uh, uh, decolonization is not a metaphor, mm. right? Because, you know, it's, people all would talk about decolonizing X or decolonizing Y, and, and, but it falls into the, the kind of a, like a, a, a manner of speaking. So, well, no, there's actually real content to it. Right? And if there's going to be real content to it, then it means there's going to be exchanges that have to be made, material exchanges that have to be made. Right? And, and they're not necessarily, you know, um, kind of the, uh, the uh, they're complicated because they require undoing kind of institutional arrangements that we've relied on and almost come to think of as natural. Right? So that, uh, um, I mean, I was thinking about this the other day, is that, you know, the, um, I teach property law in, in, in the law school, or I did, I don't, haven't taught it in a while, right? And, and, and you know, one of the, 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 the theories that the, every, every textbook advances is Locke's labor theory of value, right? You know, you, you mix your labor with, with nature and it becomes yours, right? And, you know, it only takes a second to realize that's just not true, right? Uh, but I think a lot of people believe it's true, right? Uh, and so it, 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 recognizing that, that everything we, well, all the institutions we inhabit, we created, right? They you know, provide meaning, they provide ways for us to, to act uh, without thinking because they appear as natural, right? But they were created. And if they were created, they can be redesigned. Right? And I think what you're asking us to do is to think seriously about that redesign, especially when we're looking down the barrel of climate change. Right? That it's, 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 it's the, the obligation is we can redesign it. Right? We produce a lot of these uh, problems. And the problem's going to come back and, and, and speak to us directly. Right? So, uh, so what would be the first step you'd take? Ooh. <laughs> that, that's not an easy question. <laughs> that's, it's, it's, it's the question, though. You know, it's interesting that you bring up Locke and Locke's you know, theory of property and ownership. You know, leave it to philosophers. To, uh, leave it to philosophers. Yeah, right. to, to make I, I did mention a, he's a philosopher, right? So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, well, that was cute of him. Um, <laughs> we, we could talk about Charles Mills, right? Yeah, <laughs> we could. Um, I think part of what's going on with you know, these fanciful ways of thinking about who owns what, especially when we're talking about the earth, um, and in general, the whole edifice of institutions that we build around these ideas, you know, they're, one of the things they achieve by just sticking around long enough is they really crowd out exactly these kinds of questions. Right. Right, of how we should remake the world as an actual, literal, non-metaphorical question. Right. Right? If, if you meant by decolonization really remaking the world, world. 
if you really meant land back, not we will acknowledge this land, but actually those acres are ours now, right? Okay. If that's what you meant, we'd have a very different conversation exactly. about climate politics and about decolonization, if that's the word we want to use, or any of these related names. And that's the conversation we should be having, and that's the conversation I would like to have. Um, well, it seems to me that's the conversation worth having. That's the conversation worth having, right. absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and it was, it was great to be at like the panel right before this one, mm -hmm, right. this room, where you know, folks were having that kind of conversation. And the more we do that, the better. So, you know, I would, if, if there were a place to start, um, if there were a first thing to do, you know, I wonder if the redistributing political power sort of place is the place to lean. So I'll just give a couple examples so that's clear that this is not a metaphor. Right? Um, you know, in, in New York, folks are fighting to build public renewables, right? So for there to be public ownership over energy production and provision throughout the state of New York. Um, of course, there are lots of specific land back movements, right? Where they're saying give the, this particular bit of land over to indigenous ownership and stewardship. And those are questions about who makes decisions. Right? Is it going to be utility companies that decide who gets power and when there are rolling blackouts and all those kinds of questions? Or is it going to be the people who live in New York? Um, is it going to be the US state that decides what gets done with these acres? Or is it going to be this or that indigenous nation? And there are, you know, there are better and worse versions of each of those projects, but they're different projects in kind than saying, well, maybe there should be a carbon tax or something like that, and leaving the same apparatus of people fundamentally in charge of making all the decisions about what gets produced and how much of it gets produced. I think that's right. I mean, one of the things that I was thinking about is, as you were going through the slides, right, is that, that if, if we had another overlay map, right, we could do an overlay map just for the United States, I'm not talking about the world, but just for the United States, other overlay map on incorporated and unincorporated areas where these environmental insults are located, mm. right? Which means there's a, a one, they're more often in unincorporated or county areas where you have a layer of political accountability removed, right? Uh, uh, and so when you're talking about redoing the structure of decision making politically, right, you have to take the politics as we find them Right, and address that as well, right? I mean, start where we are, right? Yeah. Start where we are. And, and I, I think that's, you know, it, it's, it, it's critical, but it also means that, you know, there's serious discussions across countries that we have to have, not just internally, but across countries. That's why CARICOM struck me as being really important, because it's a, you know, it's a, a collection of, of states, right, that are thinking about, about this issue and, and how it, uh, you know, how to address it, right? And, and to me, that's a, it's a useful uh, exemplary process, right? So um, we have, we're supposed to end at 5.15, which would give us five, 15 minutes of uh, questions from the audience. Uh, if, you, if you want to ask questions, you should let me know and raise your hand, because Other, otherwise, I, Femi and I will just talk. <laughs> uh, 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 and, you know, that's a, Always my preference, but <laughs> Xander, hello. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Taiwo. Um, my name is Xander Desus, and uh, one of the largest concerns I have for the future is uh, neo-colonial states further militarizing in response to climate refugees, uh, seeing them as national security threats. Uh, and also the military industrial complex is one of the most fossil fuel uh, dependent and ecologically devastating sectors. Uh, so uh, my question is, how do you think we can better integrate an anti-war demilitar demilitarization message uh, into decarbonizing and potentially re reallocate these funds directly into a just transition? That's a great question and a chilling one. Uh, because I, I totally agree, you know, that's, that's, 
you know, I don't think it's helpful to rank these things, but that is a particular thing that keeps me up at night. Um, and as far as I can tell, they are either on purpose or on accident building the political and literal physical infrastructure for this already. You know, the, the ICE detention centers are everywhere and they're already mixing with our other violent system of policing, our domestic violent system of policing. So it's, it's uh, hard to see things going anywhere other than that direction unless and until we start winning some victories on exactly what you're asking about. For me, I think the kinds of campaigns that you know, groups like Renewable Rikers are doing um, are what strike me as, a thing, as the thing to try that, I, that I've seen, which is just directly making challenge to, challenges to carceral institutions that are also challenges for building renewable energy. Um, so at the bottom of both of those issues is the kind of unifying question of land use right? and what the provisions of land use are going to be and what kinds of land use we think are um, our political system will allow in different parts of the world. Um, and that's something that can mobilize local community people to fight against. Um, we have to win some ideological victories to get people there, but I think that's you know, that kind of piecemeal strategy and the way that divestment campaigns have been going is probably the way forward. Uh, I, one of the things that came up when, when we were looking at the food, the food slide that you, you had, right, is that the proof that it's true, proof that it's true is the Ukraine war. Mm. Right. right. That that QED. Right. Right. I mean, you can stop stop there. Right. right. Uh, but I I recommend for students if you haven't read it, there's a little book called Louder Than Words, for those people who think that 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 there's not like resistance happening below the radar across this country. Read that book. Right. Because it's stuff that doesn't get in the headlines, uh, but people are are active. Right, and working. Because one of the questions that I, we don't have to answer it because I'll turn to the audience, I know they have more questions, is what are the forms of resistance that, that what are the forms that resistance should take mm -hmm. in our current moment, right? But I'll. Uh, so, um, wait, I, wait, 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 wait. Hundred percent sympathetic and 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 buying your argument right from the get go. I mean, why can't we have a global redistribution of resources so that all of humanity is better served than it currently is? I couldn't imagine a more wonderful thing. But as it would obviously require far more moral leaders than we have. I mean, at best, our moral leaders are focused on national interest. At worst, it's self interest. Um, so to get them to think more on this in level of interest of humanity in the global scale, I just I don't know if anyone that wise, everyone that wise is smart enough not to go into politics. So <laughs> there's that problem. The, the next problem I have, and this is a real, real tension that I struggle with, as I'm, I will also, uh, you can ask the students, they're so tired of hearing me talk about inclusive, local, grassroots decision making, let the people make the decision. At the same time, I so value the wisdom of the experts. And someone once asked me, did New Haven residents have a chance to uh, be part of the decision making about Yale students coming back during COVID? And all I could think was, oh, I certainly hope not, because those epidemiologists know way more than I do. You don't want my vote as to whether Yale should open again during COVID. I want the epidemiologists who are managing it. So how can we both embrace a more inclusive, grassroots, humanist decision-making process, and, but also retain or know how to keep value the wisdom of experts, right? It's, it's somehow breaking down that top-down, bottom-up to more of this cross-dialogue stuff, yeah. Yeah, so a couple things to say. Um, so about the moral leadership part, I mean, the short answer is this is what pitchforks are for. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> I mean, the, the long answer is, I don't think it is actually true that, um, I mean, certainly the picture that I have is a morally informed one, but there are people that stand to benefit from rearranging the world in this direction, and some of them are actually, some of them actually wield political power of consequence. Right. Um, I think a redistribution in the direction of the global south would obviously be of issue to, or would be helpful to the political elite of the global south, many of whom are, um, many of whom are, you know, more politically powerful than uh, some people realize. Um, to unfortunately the detriment of a lot of people in global south governments who are forced to fight those elites to actually get the benefits of at least country to country redistribution. So there's a complicated story of nested scales of power that we ultimately have to tell, but uh, I'm happy to say more about that in a bit. But for now, I'll just turn to the second question. So about how we can balance proper concern for expertise or knowledge or those sorts of things with um, more democratic forms of decision making. There are two things I want to say about this. One is that we can redesign decision making in general, right? So how, how I got a PhD is I decided something that was philosophically interesting to me and I convinced four people that were on my dissertation committee that I had said something about that interesting topic. Um, that, that's it, right? Um, we could add the admissions process or so on and so forth, right? Uh, I did some other stuff, but you know that's that's how we grant this level of credential in our country, um, in our education system. And while there should be flexibility to just for academics to pursue what's interesting to them, or more likely what's interesting to grant committees, right? You might Im imagine a structure where at least some of the research questions come from the people who will be affected by that research, right? That would be a differently functioning environment, and that's a kind of redesign principle that we can take to the level of actual legislating and decision making as well. You know, Experts could play an advisory role to a citizen's assembly. Um, and in fact, in parts of the world where they do have citizen's assemblies or participatory budgeting, that is in fact what happens. You will go and you take your research and you present it to the people who have to live with the outcome of your decisions and not just the citation metrics. And those people give an up or down you know, verdict on the thing that you said and it's not a perfect system any more than what we have now is a perfect system, but it is a better system, if you ask me. Thanks, Kenley. Uh, I'm going to try and do the thing they told us not to do in Ghostbusters, which is cross the streams, because I thought there was a really compelling conversation at the law school yesterday, and I would like to tie, tie some things together, because um, you discussed your paper on vice signaling um, forthcoming. And something in the one of the earlier panels today kind of tweaked my, my interest in that and thinking about it, and it's that we can call out that we're not actually doing anything about the challenges that we're facing, and that there is a profoundly, if not inept, then maybe hostile reaction on the part of elites to restructuring the systems that need to be restructured in order to provide the kinds of material changes that we're hoping for. Um, so whereas in maybe a domestic political situation, you know, talking down to others or speaking against others and vilifying the, the vulnerable parties um, is maybe one way of political decline. Um, but in the global scale, something that seems even more profoundly now um, detrimental to me is how much virtue signaling acts as a diffuser for challenges to power. And it seems like a really effective out for powerful institutions that call the shots to make it seem like they're doing something, and then also diffuse the claims of communities who might try to call them out on the ways in which they are not actually living up to those claims. So maybe not to get too Socratic, but what are then the prospects for justice if we're being blind and willingly blind to that kind of self-knowledge 
that would more effectively make us aware and sympathetic to the claims of, of disempowered others. Yeah, this is, another, this is another one on the list of things that keep me up at night. Um, the scale and sophistication of greenwashing, even compared to three years ago, it, you know, over the last couple of decades, they have just gotten much better at it than I would have guessed, you know, just, you know. So I, I think that's a, you know, virtue signaling, I, I think in climate politics, greenwashing is a, the most primary form of it, but there are other forms as well. Um, certainly, certainly a problem. I think the most, you know, I think the response to it that makes sense from my vantage point is the decolonization is not a metaphor kind of response, right? So why have divestment movements been so successful? I would argue that they've been incredibly successful. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We should uh, divest. Come on. <laughs> what are we doing? Um, but uh, in general, I think they've been hard to demobilize because you can just count the dollars, right? You can count the assets. And, you know, regardless of whether it's the Exxon Mobil Cares share or the, or the regular Exxon share, it's a share of fossil fuel stock, and you own it or you don't. Right? We say you shouldn't own it, sell it off, um, and we have this more difficult to game barometer of progress um, that is unlike listen to marginalized communities where you can just find a spokesperson who happens to align with your politics or who you pay handsomely to align with your politics. Um, you know, it's less gameable than those sorts of demands. So if we're making those demands at the level of ownership of stock, ownership of acres of land, ownership of uh, debt obligations, I think we're moving the political disputes into a harder to exploit arena. And I think that's strategic, you know, not just because it lines up with the everything's redistribution framework, but for this reason as well. Who has, oh, over here. Um, thank you so much for speaking to us. Um, I have been thinking a lot lately about regional differences in climate culpability and vulnerability between uh, different regions in the United States, so bringing this like to a more of a national level due to some decisions that were made like about land use and labor and like the Civil War and Reconstruction era, but very open to like, studying the conversation outside of that, those time frames. And I'm just wondering if you could um, talk, speak a little bit to how maybe you're seeing some of that play out in relation to the perspective that you have shared with us. So how differences in culpability like say the Gulf South and Appalachia versus the coast play out in in how climate politics are talked about in general in the US or yeah or um, both like climate change vulnerability I guess more so that since that's what okay. we've been talking about more between yeah exactly like the Gulf South and maybe like the Northeast or just more northern areas of the country yeah I mean I definitely I definitely think there's a there's a kind of political, tactical question there in terms of um, how and where you can build the kind of coalitions that are likely to win politically. Um, and there's also a moral question there, which is, you know, what does the rest of the country owe the Gulf South? Um, or, or vice versa, I guess, depending on how you think about that. Um, but, I think this is another feather in the cap of, you know, sort of Green New Deal type approaches to climate politics, ecological politics, because one of the things the federal government can do that is hard to do at any other level of politics is regionally allocate not just funds, but, you know, particular 
affordances like the Tennessee Valley Authority was under the New Deal, like that's a thing the federal government could build a renewable version of, let's say. Some people are calling for that, some people call against that, but it's hard to see how you're going to get across states um, forms of political, forms of policies that address regional problems unless you um, really hold the federal, really make the federal government hold the bag for those kinds of political questions. So I think um, it tells us something about the scale of politics we should be looking for in response to those. Well, it's 5.15. I would like to stay here till 9, uh, but I'm sure you wouldn't. Uh, um, the, for those of you who think that, that issues of reparations don't cause people to go off the rails, I urge you to, to look up, uh, it's probably on YouTube, right? Uh, uh, the senator, the candidate for senator from Alabama, right, and his response to a question about rep reparations. And any scales that may remain in your eyes will fall away. Anyway, let's give Pastor Taiwo thanks. Thank you for being here with us today.